If you have your Bible, open it to uh, Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. We've been in this ser- series called Only Believe. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, those attitudes that we need to be, the attitudes that we need to have uh, preeminent in our life. And as we've looked at these, I can tell that some of you, you, you know these things, and they've been good, kind of a good reminder for you. But also, I pray that the Holy Spirit's kind of uh, pricked us in a few areas because if we're not living up to them, I mean, that's the purpose of Jesus sharing these things with us. Uh, very first sermon he preached that we know about, and he, uh, this is the very first part of it. So it's something that was very important to him. And I pray that we have fresh eyes to be able to see these maybe as if it were the first time that we can fully grasp them and understand. I know that we, went, we may believe them intellectually, but what my goal is is that we would be able to see them for the truths that God had for us, and we may look to have them applied in our daily life, that we not overlook them, that we not forget them. The very first one was that we were blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who uh, cannot stand on their own. They're empty. They're broken without the hand of Almighty God. But he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God came for those people that are broken and bankrupt in their spirit so that God can give them everything, everything that he has in himself. And he says, blessed are those who mourn, those who see their sin, and their sin makes them grieve. It makes them grieve. When you start thinking about all the things in our life where we've come short, But he says, if you look at those sins the way God looks at them, it says, you will be comforted. If you grieve over your sins, God will comfort you. Then he says, blessed are the meek. Those who uh, lower themselves under the control of God's will for their life. We're not in control. He needs to be in control. So we lower ourselves to let him be in control of our daily situation and our circumstances. Jesus was from heaven. The creator God knew all things, and yet he limited himself to what God wanted him to do each and every day. And that was his pleasure, was to do the will of God. And blessed are those who want more of God. They're hungry. They thirst for the righteousness of God. For those are the ones who will be filled. And blessed are the ones who are grateful for the sweet, sweet grace of God, where God pours out his goodness upon us. And because of that, we're grateful that he does for us. And yet, we are grateful that he doesn't give us what we deserve, but he gives us better. And he says, if we will be merciful to others, God will even bless us with more mercy in our own life. And then he says, the one for today, uh, verse number eight, very simple, blessed are the pure in heart. Now hear the, the blessing that comes from it. For they shall see God. These are the ones on this side of glory, on this side of glory, who will still get a glimpse of the Almighty. An opportunity to see Him. To walk with Him. An opportunity to be able to uh, be there in the radiance of His glory. And as you go through this thing called life with pain, with heartache, with brokenness, with evil, You want to be close to God there. You want to be able to see the blessings that can come even out of hardship, even out of loss, even out of pain. Remember what I said last week about the the famous preacher that I was talking about? He said the only times that he's ever grown in his life were not in the places of blessing where everything was going well, but in the places of brokenness and hurt and pain because God made those areas blessings as well. Now, I want to share with you from the very beginning. 
as I've prayed over this, as I've studied this, as I've looked, because as y'all know, I don't, I, I need wisdom. I, I, I want to know what, what, what God has to say about all these things. So I'll go and I'll listen to people that I respect and and, and I want to hear what they had to say about this. When you get to the Beatitudes and you get to this one, not much is said. They kind of gloss over the top. They kind of hit it very lightly. Because when people look at this, they just say, well, blessed are the pure in heart. It's almost like the songs that we sing. Blessed are the holiness of, that comes from God. And I understand that there are things that God has done for us that only He can do. God left heaven, Jesus left heaven to come down here to live the sinless life, to, to put us first, and was willing to go to the cross to be our sacrifice. He was willing to shed His blood, to give His life so that we could be cleansed from our sins so that we can become whole and complete in Him, so that we could know life and know it everlasting, so that He could do for us what only He could do. And if we are wise enough to turn from our sins, repent of our sins, and give our heart and life to Him, we can be cleansed, we can be made whole, listen to me now, and He can declare righteousness over us. But how many of you feel holy? How many of you feel like you're doing everything that God would have you to do? How many of you, how many of you have areas in your life of brokenness that are unnecessary? How many of you have afflictions when God has so much more for us? I think holiness is a good idea, don't you? But maybe God was saying a little bit more to us. I believe that he is. So before we even look any further, I think it would be wise for us if we could just pause and ask the helper, the comforter, our God, the one that will lead us into all truth, because what we're going to need to see what God has for us, to see Him truly as He is, is to be able to have the ears open to the Holy Spirit. And he's, He needs to come. Now, I know God's everywhere. I know His Spirit is amount, uh, abounding. I understand that. But there's a difference when we tune out everything else and listen purely to Him. I think that's what we need today. So let's ask Him to do that very thing from the beginning. Let's pray. Lord, it's not in how much we know. It's not in how good we are. We know you, and you are everything that is good. So, Lord, we, we give you great praise today. We give you honor, and we give you glory. We bring before you thanksgiving, because if it were not for you, we'd still be in that broken, bankrupt place with no hope for the future. But you have honored us. You have given us the gift of Jesus. And for those that are wise enough to receive it, the Holy Spirit has come. And Jesus has declared righteousness over us. But we're still in this evil world and we still have evil intentions within us. So, Lord, we need you to speak. Spirit, show us truly what it means when Jesus said happy or blessed or anointed are those that are pure in heart, for they shall see you. We want to see you. We need to see you. Help us to learn how. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The word pure for pure in heart means simply clean y'all like clean i mean i got up this morning and took a shower and my sole desire was to be clean amen i wanted to wash off the dirt all on the outside and get all prettied up or at least the best i could do amen but what god's saying is we need to get cleaned up on the inside as well 
It means to be blameless. Listen to me now. Unstained from guilt. Does anybody carry guilt? Has anybody gone through difficulties in life and still you feel the pain from it? Now, I'm great. I'm absolutely great with God looking on me and declaring righteousness on me. Not in how good I am, but Christ's goodness, His righteousness being given to me. I'm great with that. And yet, I need to have the fullness of God over me. I need to have, listen to me now, Christ-likeness in my daily mind, in my thinking, in my walk, and in my life. So there are two words that are ignored here that we need to look at that I think will clarify a little bit more for us what it means to be pure in heart. And the first word is the word fire. Fire. John the Baptist said, when he was talking about the one that would come after him, he was there to prepare the way. But he was talking about Christ. He said, I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now the fire that he's speaking of is that which will come in and burn away the areas of sin in our life. Malachi in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 2, said the Messiah will come as a refiner's fire. If you take a, a, something like gold or silver or anything like that and you put it under the fire, it will separate the pure from the dross, the impure. So in speaking of pure in heart, he says, the fire of God will come to separate the good from that which needs to be taken away. The second term that he uses is the word pruning. Pruning. And if you know from God's Word in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, he says, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And we come to know Jesus Christ we are grafted into the vine, okay? We were wild. We, were, we had nothing in us. We had no life within us, but we were grafted in. So that which flows through the vine, the Holy Spirit of God, flows now within us. And he said, when we are grafted into the vine, guess what happens? God produces fruit in, with, and through us. So that branch bears fruit. Y'all good with that? And what's the blessing that comes from that? The gardener, now it says Jesus is the vine, we are the branch, but our Father, our God, is the gardener. So he comes and inspects and looks at it. And anything that is keeping fruit from happening in the right season, he will come and prune. Cut it off. Get rid of it. Now hold on. If there's any branch that's not bearing fruit, he cuts it off and throws it into the fire. But if it is producing fruit within it, he will prune it. Because that's where the real fruit will come. Have you ever seen, and by the way, it's going to happen pretty soon. I mean, the last couple of days it's been 66, 67, 68 degrees. The flowers are starting to come up and it looks pretty. And what's going to happen on the trees, the fruit trees? All of a sudden those blooms are going to come, right? But if there was no pruning, it will look beautiful and it will look green, won't it? But there won't be any fruit. So the gardener says there must be the pruning so that the maturation process, the, the maturing process, the, the new life can come within us. Now hear this. This thing that we know in our heads, but we need to have manifested in our life. Blessed, anointed, happy are those who are pure. Cleansed. Right? Those that have had the fire of God to burn out the dross that are distracted 
all those areas cut off from our life. Pure in heart. Heart is that area of, not that thing that just goes kathump, kathump, right? But it's those areas in our life, areas in our life where our emotion and the spirit live and dwell. And those things there um, our thoughts, our desires, our sense of purpose, our will, what we want, what we understand, your character, those all flow from the heart. So what are we saying we want pure? We want our thoughts to be pure, our desires to be pure, our purpose to be pure, our will to be pure, our, our understanding of what God's doing in our life. All of our character needs to come with the pureness of God. It involves having a singleness of heart towards God. No hypocrisy. No saying on Sunday, Lord, you are great, you are God, you are awesome, and I love you. And in the rest of the week, living your life your own way. No hidden motives, but being transparent. having an uncompromising desire to please Him. Pure in heart versus a divided heart. A heart headed for God, but a heart wanting other things too. A pure heart only wants the things of God. A divided heart, a distracted heart. Oh, Jesus, I want to be with you. Hey, I want to do this over here too. Look, if Jesus were alive today and in the physical flesh and walking down here with him, would you want to get up close? Amen. You want to see him. You want to hear him. You want to feel his everything that's effervescent that's flowing from him. You wouldn't want to be walking with him and say, hey, I, hey, I got to go do something over here, over here. My phone. Oh, I got to go talk to so-and-so. Hey, look at this. That's nice. I've been waiting to see this. And I spend four hours there and then go, back. oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant to be with you. I got to go work. You do your thing. I got to go do my thing. It's not a divided heart. It's not a distracted heart. And it's not a defiled heart. Y'all look at me. There's some things in our life that you no longer want in there. And God no longer wants in there but they stay in there because we allow them to stay in there. There's some hurts and pains that we have been dealing with for a long time. There's some wounds. I told the people in the first service, there are some areas in my life, some vulnerabilities, some things that I have been, been dealing with that I have been dealing with since I was five or six. I'm 59. You do the math. There's some other areas in my life that I've been thinking about this past week, that I've been dealing with for about 43 years. And I'm still affected by it. And I know if that's me, that's probably you as well. There's some wounds, there's some pains, there's some difficulties. Some of these things come from how the world has treated us, or how we think the world views us. But I'm here to tell you, God looks at things differently than the way the world looks at things. We need to be led by the Spirit. And we need to follow Him. It, it's as if we walk in our human reasoning until it lets us down, and then we run back to God. Let me tell you a story I think that will illustrate it. When Israel was together, they, they wanted to be like the rest of the world, and they demanded a king. And they went to the prophet Samuel and said, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. So Samuel, the prophet, went to God, and God told him, said, look, don't take this personal... They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So we'll give them a king. If that's what they want, we'll give them a king. And Samuel went to find the next king with the Lord's leadership. 
And when he saw this guy, he immediately knew he was the one. He was head and shoulders taller than anyone else. He was big and he was handsome and he was strong. And he was, he was the same. When you looked at it, you say, now that's a king. And his name was Saul. And he began well. But there was something that let him down. His heart wasn't loyal to God. And God rejected him. But Samuel still wanted God to do a work in his life. And God literally went to Samuel and said, Look, why do you continue to pine after the one that I've rejected? He's no longer my king. He doesn't have my heart within him. He has other desires and wants to do it his way. So God sent the prophet Samuel to the city of Bethlehem to the house of Jesse. They were going to have a feast there. So he was going to sanctify the children of Jesse for this feast. And Samuel had experience doing this before. And when he saw one of Jesse's sons, he said, that's the one. He chose him himself like he saw when he saw King Saul. Big and tall and beautiful and handsome and strong and, and he's got a charisma about him and that's got to be the one. I said that to share with you what God said about this. Listen to God's words to Samuel when Samuel thought he had the next one to be king. He said, For man looks at the outward appearance. Man looks at the outward appearance. We have our, you ever heard of uh, your first impression? You look at something and you have a first impression. Have you ever heard the term that your first impression is the best one? Follow your first impression. You ever heard that? Uh, let me tell you the results of that. It may work. It may not. Have y'all ever had a first impression that didn't work out so well? Any of you guys looked at that girl and said, oh, that's the one. That is the one. And you, somehow you talked her into saying uh, yes to a date, and you went out and your heart was beating so fast, and you said, this is the one. And then you got to know her, and you said, no, she's not. <laughs> Amen and Hallelujah. Oh, don't think us just the guys. These girls think, oh, if he would just ask me out, how great it would be, right? And then you get to know him and you're saying, I'd rather, you know, drink arsenic, right? <laughs> be careful. But it is natural for us to follow human reasoning, to follow human ways. But we were called for so much more. It's almost as if we were walking with Christ. Jesus is down here, and we're walking with him, and we look at something. We look at something different than the way. I mean, Jesus looks at him, and we're like, no, 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 Jesus, that's not the way it was. Now, y'all don't act so holy. You remember when Jesus told his disciples, I've got to, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I will die. They will crucify me on the cross but I will be resurrected and I will give new life. You remember when Peter went to him and said, Lord, I know you, you feel this way, but, but, but understand we're behind you. The old rock's here for you. I won't let you down. You need to forget talking about this crucifixion and death. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Now it was Peter's impression. It was Peter's human wisdom but it wasn't the will and the strength and the ways of God. We all do it. Remember when the children came to Jesus and the disciples said, you want us to get rid of these kids? And Jesus is like, don't forbid the kids to come to me. Such is the kingdom of God. He, they looked at it as a bad thing. Jesus said, oh, no, no, this is a good thing. Have you ever looked at something as a bad thing? But God actually was saying it was a good thing. 
Now, if y'all listen quick, I'll keep going. But if I need to repeat myself here four or five times, I will. Be very careful of judging by human reasoning and understanding when God has so much more for us. God has so much more. For man looks at the outward thing, but the Lord looks at the heart. We would have loved old Samuel, I mean uh, Saul, but we would have loved David too. David was good looking. David had charisma. David had a lot of, of giftedness. You know, all of us have things in our life that, that we were just born with. I mean, you just have all of these things, but what are you doing with them? How are you using them? Are you using them for the glory of God? God is looking down, and, and you may be as beautiful as David, and you may be as charismatic, charismatic and as gifted as David was. You may be a natural-born leader. You may, David was a great guy who, who never overlooked anyone. Everybody was somebody to David. And you may have that same spirit about you. But God wants to do all. He wants to sanctify those areas of your life. He wants to glorify himself by using your life. I want to share something. Uh, and, and folks, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm not trying to be cute. I pray this can be helpful. I'm not trying to show you how smart I am because I didn't come up with this. But I think I'm sharing it because the Lord really laid it upon my heart. And that means in the next few moments, if we could be open, God may set us free just a little bit. It's called the Johari window or the Johari principle. It's been around since 1955. It's been taught in colleges. It's in a lot of the textbooks that we have. It was written by two men, Joseph Lutz and uh, Harrington uh, Ingram. So how did they name it? They put the first two letters of Joe, Joseph, Joe, the first four letters of Harrington, H-A-R-I. They put them together and they called it the Johari window. It is used by, uh, it's basically how you view yourself and how others view you. And it's used in self-assessment. It's when groups of people can get together and, and, and how they can inner work together. It's used by businesses and, 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 and groups and in, in teams. Churches use it in staff. We use it in discipleship groups because it helps us grow stronger together. So let's see if we can talk about this and maybe it can help you. If we look at the first window. Now, I hope you can see this. Can y'all see that? Across the, the, the left-hand side, you'll see it's, these are the things that you know about yourself, right? And then um, the things on the right-hand side are the things that you do not know about yourself. So let's, let's look at these together. Look at the very first one. This is the open area or the arena area in your life. This is the things that you know about you and that you let others see in you too. You know it and you're okay with other people knowing it as well. Now this may be, though it's, I, I put all four of these up here on, on equal blocks, but this one may be bigger or it may be smaller depending. This is your personal persona. These are the things that are there as, and how you basically present yourself to the world. And we want to be seen in a good light, right? And we want others to see us very well. So these are the things that we know about our life and others know about our life as well. Let's go look at the next one. This is called the blind spot. This is the things, listen to me now, that we don't see about us, but others do see. The things that I'm not aware of in my life, but when you look at me, you see them. Have you ever been around somebody who um, was just as prideful as could be, but they didn't know it? Just as egotistical? And they just, they just thought they were the most humble person in the world, and you looked at them and you went, really? Y'all ever done that?
that person. Maybe they've got all these little uh, hiccups in their life. Maybe they're, they, they, they're very insecure, and it comes out very easily. Seen. But they don't see it. Maybe there's something that happened to them in their life. There's been a, a hurt or a pain. Now, hold on. I, I'm going to share personally. I said in, in, there's some areas in my life that I've been battling since I was probably five or six years old, but I haven't always been aware of that. As a matter of fact, it took a lot of looking at my life, a lot of prayer in my life to see the root cause of some of the things that I battled in my life. And I have found that some of those things go back to the time I was five or six years old. I was unaware, but I also found out that other people could look at them and say, you know, I knew that about you. So we have a blind spot. Let's look at the third area. This is the things that you know about you but others don't know about you. That's why it's called the hidden window. Things I know about my life, but you don't see. You don't know. That's why, look at that second word there, a facade. A facade. Now, let me go back to the blind spot. That is the things that you don't know that others do know. Wouldn't it be great if we had people who loved us unconditionally, friends. Wouldn't it be good if we could get in a group together and they could say to you, you don't see this, but it's real. This is why the Jahari window works so well in self-assessment and in group settings. Not a big group, but in a group that you trust. But when you get to the hidden area, you know those things, but others don't. So you can have a group around you, but they don't know. So what's going to have to happen here is you're going to have to get open. You're going to have to be transparent. Now hear me. A lot of people never want this to ever happen. There are things that they battle in their life, things that they're going through, and they want them hidden forever. And the problem with that is you're going to keep that problem forever. God wants to do a work, but we want to press it down. We want to hide it. Now, these are positive and negative. Hidden, things that you know that others don't know. Some of y'all can sing, but nobody ever knows because you don't ever sing around them. Some of y'all have some unbelievable giftedness that God gave you that you really enjoy, but, but you're afraid to, and if others see you, they'll, they'll judge you by it. There's a lot of giftedness that's there, but there's a lot of hurt that's there too. Now let's look at the last one. This is called the unknown. This is the area in your life that you're not aware of and others aren't aware of either. So you can have a group around you that love you, but they can't help you because they don't see it. And you don't see it either. Listen to me. This is where the love of God comes in. This is where the work of the Holy Spirit can come in. And the Holy Spirit can reveal to you. Personally in my life, there are two major areas that I've had to deal with. One since I was five or six. One since I was about 16. And both of those areas, I was unaware of the ramifications of them in my life. But the Spirit loved me enough to put His finger on it. And by the way, there were times He'd have to say it again. Sometimes I would ignore it. Sometimes I would just say, oh, that's just normal. But the later He'd come back and go, I think that there are a lot of Christians today who say the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, has declared righteousness over me. I have been cleansed from my sins. I'm going to heaven one day. Now, I'm broken and shattered right now, but, but, but I'm good in God's eyes, and that's all that matters. He may have declared righteousness over you, but He wants righteousness in your daily walk as well for your benefit, 
and for His glory. He doesn't want you to continue to walk broken and hurting and in pain. Blessed, happy are those who have purity in their heart through the refining fire of God, burning out the dross of sin in your daily life. Pruning back those areas of a divided or a hypocritical part in your life. Opening yourself up to new opportunities of blessing. God wants to do so much. And so it says, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. So how do we start? Very quickly, accept his love. You're going to go through things in your life and you're not going to understand it and you might get angry at God. You may, you want to, you may want to blame God. You may want to wish it were differently. How many people wish they looked differently? How many people said, I, I wish I could lose weight? How many people say, I wish I had a better job? How many I wish that I could uh, be successful in this area of my life? I, I wish, I wish, I won't, I whatever. But yet you just need to understand that God loves you, come on now, just the way that you are, but loves you enough not to let you stay there. He wants to put a little heaven in you right now. No bland cooking. He's going to put some spice of glory all over your life. You're going to smell like Jesus when it happens. Accept his love. Accept his love. Accept the salvation, but understand it's not a finished work. Number two, cry out to God. In the areas that you need help, cry out. Psalms 51.10 says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We need God's help. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Would you create in me that pure heart? Accept his love. Cry out to God. Remove what you know is in the way. There's a scripture that I was thinking about when I came to this point. I love, it's, it's, it's written by the Apostle John, who, by the way, in his time, Jesus gave him a nickname too. He called him the Beloved. I believe the Apostle John, he was once called a son of thunder, but when he met the love of God, it changed him. And I think that there was really something sweet. I hate to say that, but it's almost a, us men think that's a negative, but, but Jesus thought it was very much a positive thing in him. And in John's first letter, his epistle, 1 John, in chapter number 3, verse number 1, the Bible says this, What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Man, what a blessing to be called a child of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it does not know Him. Hey, don't worry about what the world says about you. Don't worry about what the, the, the world says that you're successful or not. If you're trying to please the world... You're going to have a very difficult time. He said, but, but just to understand this, he said, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Now here, listen. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Now this is not just simply talking about what we're going to look like in heaven. When we see him, we'll have an understanding of what he wants in us. Though it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, we know that when he is revealed, when we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now hear this. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure, purifies himself. Oh God, 
Refine me with your fire. Lord, prune me. Lord, anything in my life that is not a blessing to me and to you, we need to get that out of here. Lord, I need to have new eyes. I need to see things the way you see things. I'm not going to follow my impressioning and my human reasoning and my human understanding. I need more than that. Church, listen, he wants to give that to each and every one of us. His goal, his desire is to pour out his blessings on us. But we can't accept the divided heart, the defiled heart, the deceived heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says plainly, I want to quote it right, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you're following your heart, well, my heart's telling me, be careful. It may deceive you. God said it's deceitful above all things and wicked. We don't need our heart. We need his heart. I'm a walker. I love to walk. I love to hike. I love to get out in nature. And, and for some strange reason, I love to get up and climb mountains. Have you ever been hiking and you, you, as you were going up a mountain, man, you said, hey, I might have bit off more than I can chew here. This is hard. This is difficult. I don't know that I want to do this. But you kept going. You kept going. And it was windy, and you'd go up and then down a little bit and up higher, down a little bit and around this curve and around. Am I ever going to get there? And you try to get a good view, but the trees are still there, and you can't get a good view of it. And you, you want to stop. You want to turn back. You want to settle, right? You, you want to say, this is okay, but yet there's something within you that just pushes you forward. And you go, and you go. And by the way, the last part's usually the steepest part, isn't it? But yet when you get there, you go, wow, look at this view. Look at how great this is. It was so much better to go the extra mile. It was so much worth it not to give up, but to push through. I think about the book of Kings. There was a prophet by the name of Elijah. He was walking by, and a woman saw him. A woman saw him and said, I perceive that a man of God has just passed by. Wow. She wasn't looking at the outward appearance. She wasn't saying, man, that's a smart guy right there. She hadn't talked to him. I bet he's a, a, great, I bet he's a great leader. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's just a, full of charisma. He just walked by. Come on now. But that which was on the inside was being seen on the outside. I don't think Elijah knew it. There was a humility and a holiness about him. He didn't know, but others knew. I wonder what God, Jesus Christ, would be saying about our lives. Are we okay to settle just to live on human reasoning? Or do we really want to pursue having a heart only made perfect by Him, but made pure, clean, blameless, undivided, no hypocrisy, nothing hidden, transparent, open, and blessed spirit known if the holy spirit has spoken it's because he wants to draw you to himself